Uh, okay, so I am going to talk about uh, estimating heterogeneous policy impacts using causal machine learning in a, in a case study of an evaluation of a health insurance program in Indonesia. Um, this, this collaboration with Indonesia researchers happened due to very uh, kind of real uh, interests of um, providing robust evaluations of the country's ongoing um, healthcare reforms. But on the way uh, of doing this research, I, I discovered some very, very useful looking statistical tools, which hopefully help us answer policy level questions better than we could before. So um, we have a working paper version of, of some of this work, actually most of the work which I'm going to present today. It's still uh, in progress in terms of publishing it, uh, as you might imagine. And today's seminar really motivated me to, you know, get some new work done. So I'm quite excited about the new uh, the, the new part of the talk, which is around estimating optimal policies. Um, and hopefully we have time to have some discussion about that because I I really would appreciate some feedback there. OK, so uh, so what's the outline? I'm going to talk a little bit about why we care about heterogeneous treatment impacts in policy evaluation, what are these and why we would like to know about them. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, how this problem could be solved uh, by an appropriate combination of causal inference and machine learning tools, and why why there has been many many methods uh, kind of developed and under development to address these sort of questions. I'm going to here focus on the, the tools currently developed by Susan Athey, an economist, uh, and her collaborators. And all this, hopefully, I will talk a bit about methods and then a bit about the application in a context of the health insurance um, uh, program in Indonesia. And we are going to focus on maternal healthcare utilization as, as an outcome of interest. So, so why, why we care? Um, well, as a health economist, we, we do try to answer causal questions. Um, a lot of them, most most questions we try to answer are really causal, and they, they they tend to relate to some sort of intervention and an impact of an intervention. This can be as simple as you know giving a drug or not to a patient, but it can be also more uh, perhaps a little bit more complex, like how much nutrition to give to a child at the intensive care unit. That's still kind of like a clinical biostats question, and then moving towards more health policy questions, we care about. Uh, health uh, system level health policies such as providing health insurance uh, subsidized free health insurance to people in a country uh, we care about questions such as did this work w was this a success this program would this program be a success maybe in a different setting um, well these sort of questions uh, rarely can be answered using a randomized trial sometimes they can like for example, the drug sort of questions, and uh, increasingly in uh, development, uh, global health, development economics, we do have uh, randomized trials for different sort of interventions as well, such as uh, cash transfers and so on. But but an empirical researcher who wants to evaluate health policies typically faces the reality of no uh, of no. Uh, no randomized trials, so we have to rely on some sort of natural experiments. We need to look for uh, variations in policies. Uh, we need to look for uh, a variation in when and how a policy was rolled out. We tend to call these natural experiments, but as a more kind of all-encompassing label, uh, we essentially work in the world of observational data. And uh, estimating a treatment effect for observational data is, is pretty difficult even to get the average right. So maybe this is why um, evaluations don't tend to go much further than that. They don't tend to uh, try to answer more exciting questions, such as, did the policy work for a group it was really intended to help? Who were, who were the relative winners and losers of a policy? Did the program uh, improve? Um, for example, healthcare access to mo those mostly in need, and in general, how could the design of the future programs be improved from what we learn from a study? So these are questions we would like to answer, and uh, well, um, kind of a basic um, 
approach to, to answering these questions can be, well, let's do a subgroup analysis. Let's look at the programming impacts for quintiles of socioeconomic status, for the low and high, high educated, for men versus women, for a bunch of subgroups. Um, well, um, even in evaluations which have been, which are randomized and they have a nice uh, pre-analysis plan, um, such uh, subgroup analysis is a little bit of concern because, well, it's it's really hard to pre-specify everything. If we do pre-specify, we, we need a really huge power. So with observational studies, people don't even actually bother in terms of pre-specifying. So people just look at whatever subgroups they kind of hope to find something interesting. And uh, this obviously raises the concern that researchers might actually cherry pick uh, not complete, in not completely principled ways the subgroups of which we are looking at, for example, to hope for results with the small p-value and the large treatment effect. Uh, and there is an increasing uh, uh, recognition that we can do better than that. We can use the data to learn about important subgroups. We can use the data in principled, non-cherry picky ways to, to learn about what uh, drives a heterogeneity in, in, a, in a, the impact of a, of a program. And um, we can even uh, hope to inform uh, questions such as who to treat or who to make eligible using such data adaptive, adaptive um, uh, methods. So I was already alluding to how the methods literature is very, very active in this field, both in statistics and most recently in econometrics. And um, question, I mean, this is my very um, kind of ad hoc uh, grouping of the methods, and there are many more out there. But one important strand of methods quite ambitiously aims to estimate the so-called conditional average treatment effect function, which is essentially a function which maps someone's observed characteristics man, woman, poor, rich, urban, rural, age, education, and so on, into an expected benefit. So if we know someone's X variables, we hope to know how much they would benefit. Uh, we will see later that this is an ambitious goal, and uh, it's not always pursued. Another maybe less ambitious goal is, well, we don't need this entire function. Maybe we could just try to look for subgroups of those units who would uh, have the highest and lowest benefits of treatment effects. And maybe as a, as a bonus, we could try to understand something about the predictors of the response. So we don't need to know exactly how much the response was, but we, we, we would like to know how much, what predicts this. And the third group of um, methodological investigation um, doesn't even necessarily care about this, but wants to go straight on to the real goal, which is uh, how to assign policy. So we don't really care about uh, what predicts the, the treatment effects. We don't really care about knowing exactly the treatment effect. We want to know how to assign a policy across population, uh, across, across units in a population, so that we maximize expected gains. So these are this is the literature on optimal um, treatment regimes in biostats, dynamic optimal treatment regimes in, in economics. Uh, these are often called empirical welfare maximization methods, and these literatures are sort of a meeting uh, nowadays. Um, the two, the two uh, kind of methods um, focus I'm going to take today is the first and the last one. So we will try to learn about the conditional treatment effect function. And we are also trying to learn something about optimal policy assignment rules. And something to point out that all this literature, or like more, definitely most of it, has a very strong uh, grounding in semi-parametric statistical theory, in which I'm pretty sure many of you are much better uh, conversant than me. Um, and semi-parametric statistical theory recently is making a lot of use of machine learning. So these are the, 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 the sort of uh, ground, uh, ground uh, literature which are really informing these investigations. OK, so so much about the methods, uh, the, the excitement of, about the methods. So there's a lot, lots of things to try. Uh, what is, what is our, our policy evaluation question here? So. Well, without uh, without uh, giving you a full historical background about what's going on in Indonesia, uh, what I can definitely tell you that it is undergoing huge changes in the health system. It has the super ambitious goal of trying to provide universal health coverage 
for everyone, 270 million people uh, in the country. And uh, this, um, well, they don't try to do this from one day to another. They have been uh, setting up systems of contributory health insurance programs for those informal sectors since the 1970s. Uh, and while they also increasingly realized that poor people uh, need some health insurance too. So they have been rolling out schemes of subsidized health insurance schemes from the 1990s. Um, from 2014, there is a law of universal health insurance. So everyone has the, the opportunity to be insured, uh, but still around 20% of the population is still uninsured. So it's still a very acute um, health policy problem. Um, and uh, knowing something about how much these uninsured people would actually benefit from being insured and whom to prioritize with the insurance uh, seems like a, seems like an important uh, question to seek answer to so the sort of questions more specific questions we are asking here uh, using the data we have access to is um, well uh, did health insurance uh, coverage improve access to health care we are looking at uh, mothers who are giving birth. So the healthcare access we are talking about here is um, delivering uh, the baby um, attended by a midwife or health professionals, assisted birth. Um, we have two health insurance programs um, in our data sets. So we, we want to know which one worked better. So uh, did the subsidized health insurance for the poor, poor people work as well as the contributory health insurance for those who had uh, who had this, this formal sector health insurance benefits? And of course, we would like to know how these impacts vary among population subgroups. So we have a couple of pre-specified subgroups. We are interested in socioeconomic quintiles. We are interested in education rural and urban status, but we also want to see whether the data and these algorithmic tools available for us can actually tell us a bit more about what else might matter uh, for how much a person can benefit from health insurance. And ideally, we also would like to uh, start answering question, who should be insured out of these people still uninsured. And if we cannot insure everyone at the same time, because there are capacity constraints, uh, how could we prioritize eligibility for health insurance? So the data uh, which we have uh, is, is a very um, good quality uh, panel uh, data set. It's called the Indonesian Family Life Survey. Uh, I, I recommend it to you know, uh, PhD students or, 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 or researchers who are looking for, for nice, nice longitudinal data. And we have put together uh, a data set of 11,000 births. This is a retrospective birth cohort. So women are asked about birth in the last five years. And um, very importantly, we know whether at the time in the year of the birth, someone was insured or not. And if they were insured, which health insurance scheme were they insured under the subsidized scheme or the other one? And uh, well, when I talk about this research with economists, then they uh, normally stop me here and they, they ask me whether there was any sort of discontinuity or, or any really uh, exciting exogenous variation in the, uh, in the eligibility criteria. And the answer is that, well, unfortunately, we could not really find any. Um, when we are fitting propensity scores, uh, you will see later, we find that both in the uninsured and the two insured uh, groups, there were people from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of socioeconomic uh, quintiles and all sorts of uh, uh, other characteristics. Uh, we focus on birth assisted by health professional and the coverage we adjust for will be very much motivated by our causal assumptions, which I will cover in a second. But we do have access to a rich set of individual household level, village level coverage, um, which uh, we think uh, are related to whether someone is eligible or takes up health insurance or not, and also predicts um, whether they would uh, otherwise use health services or not. This is around 20 coverage, some most of them categorical or binary. And we when we factorize this into binary variables, this will be around 50 binary variables. I am I am often asked this question because of the, the machine learning tools used. So it's around 20, 10,000 10, n and the p is around 50. 
Okay, so we would like to do causal inference. So we imagine ourselves in the world of potential outcomes. So we posit that every unit in our data set, every uh, woman we, we observe in this data set has two potential outcomes, uh, one if they were insured and one if they were uninsured. And ideally, we would like to know the individual level causal effect, y i1 minus y i0. Um, due to the fundamental problem of causal inference, of course, we cannot observe anyone in both of these states. So instead of the individual level treatment effect, we start looking for some averages. And the usual uh, causal estimates corresponding to average treatment effects tend to ask questions such as what would be the contrast between two words when we give everyone health insurance versus no one. This would be the average treatment effect. We can also ask the question, how would the word differ for those who got the health insurance if we took it away from them? So they didn't get the health insurance. What would be, how big would, they, would this contrast be? And uh, finally, what about those who didn't have the health insurance? How much they would on average gain if they actually had it? And I would argue that for this policy evaluation question, when there is still a lot of people without insurance, this is a quite interesting uh, quantity. So we would be trying to answer this question. Well, but uh, as I said earlier, we would not want to stop uh, at the averages. So we are interested in this conditional average treatment effect function, which now has that X conditioning on the right hand side uh, of the expectation. So suddenly, instead of this of parameter of interest being a scalar, it is a function and it can be pretty high dimensional. So we, if we only had a couple of variables, uh, be, which we thought can modify the impact of, of health insurance, then this could correspond to a bunch of subgroup specific treatment effects. But because we are a bit more ambitious and we would like to understand how, uh, how uh, the expected impacts vary with a large number of coverage, this can be, this can be high dimensional and, it, and, and a challenge to estimate. So I will talk a little bit about that, how we estimate this. Well, in order to identify these causal estimates, we do need assumptions. So we need or know, in this case, we would rely on the assumption of no unmeasured confounders. So all of those individual household uh, village level coverage, which we observed, are actually sufficient to make the potential outcomes independent from the treatment assignment. This is a strong assumption. When I talk to economists, they again stop me here and ideally they kind of want to just keep talking about this for the rest of the seminar uh, we do we do add um, province uh, dummies uh, to control for potentially unobserved province level characteristics um, which don't change over the years and we also include uh, birth of year fixed effects so so we are going a little bit further from i don't know unmeasured confounders assumption but not very far and we need overlap. So overlap would mean here that there are no such characteristics which would perfectly predict the insurance status. So if there was a very good eligibility um, set of eligibility criteria put down on paper, uh, then maybe there would not be, be no overlap. This, luckily, we can check this uh, with our data and we did find uh, overlap. So uh, there, there will be all sorts of people in all sorts of groups, essentially. So once we, we are happy, or at least not too unhappy, to assume these identifying assumptions, we can, we can move on to, to actually try to estimate these things, the average treatment effect and the conditional average treatment effect. And estimators of uh, these estimates uh, tend to combine, uh, in some ways, uh, outcome regressions and propensity scores. They, uh, these are often combined in uh, estimators which are which are called doubly robust, meaning if one of them we got right, then uh, we have an unbiased estimator for for estimate of interest. So, for example, an inverse probability weighted outcome regression, which I'm going to implement later, would be such an example. And as I as I try to uh, uh, refer to this before, increasingly. Um, variants of these approaches. Uh, pop up, which actually use machine learning uh, as uh, estimators in their, uh, in their nuisance functions. Uh, these are, these are uh, very useful 
to address anxieties about functional forming specification. These machine learning variants are not going to do anything about our identifying assumptions. We have already we have already assumed those, but in order to be somewhat more relaxed, that we haven't made uh, very big mistakes about misspecifying the regression function and the propensity score, machine learning uh, nuisance functions are very useful. Uh, TMLE or double machine learning are examples. And estimators, which are uh, which are uh, aiming to estimate this conditional treat average treatment effect, which um, which is our our, in our main interest, build on these. So so let me show you one one solution or one proposed solution to estimate the conditional average treatment effect. This is the solution proposed again by by Athey and colleagues. Um, it's the causal forest estimator, which is often uh, also increasingly labeled as the R learner. So if you have seen the R learner or causal forest before, this is it. So our motivating model is a partially linear model where our outcome of interest, in this case, um, uh, assisted uh, birth, uh, depends in a non-parametric way on the axis so we don't we don't specify a function from there but there is an additive treatment effect and some error term and for now assume that the additive treatment effect tau is homogeneous then um, one trick we can use to get to a good estimator of our treatment effect is residual by residualizing both the outcome and the treatment variable by essentially uh, taking, taking uh, their predicted versions and subtracting them from their own values. So we get residual for the treatment assignment uh, variable, which is essentially the treatment indicator minus the propensity score. And we also take a residual for the outcome variable, which is essentially the outcome variable minus the condition expectation. And these are also sometimes called pseudo outcomes. Um, and these P, Px and Mx can be estimated using machine learning algorithms. Uh, when we do both of these uh, with machine learning, this is often called double machine learning. And what can we do with these, these residuals? Uh, well, we can put them into a new regression, which is a very, very simple linear regression when we are regressing y, the y residual on this uh, w residual. And the the proposal by uh, Chernozokov and colleagues is that um, the, the resulting estimator is actually the estimator for the average treatment effect. It's consistent, asymptotically linear, and if we use uh, strict procedures of sample splitting, we can actually use a wide range of machine learning algorithms without the danger of overfitting. Well, but we are interested in heterogeneous treatment effects, not, not homogeneous treatment effects. So um, we extend this partial linear model, uh, and now we allow tau to be uh, to depend on x. So now tau x is this heterogeneous treatment effect, and this is our new estimate. Um, well, what could we do? We could try to estimate tau from using the same simple regression we saw before, but in a small neighborhood. Uh, of x so so in a neighborhood where x's are quite similar and and we also hope that this this treatment effects uh will be also fairly similar so if we have that then we, we could just have um have this local uh, treatment effect and we could we could do this in many many neighborhoods uh, the question is of course uh how to choose this neighborhood and um this is where machine learning comes in. This is where uh, AT and colleagues has suggested that, well, we could take a uh, well-loved and popular uh, off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm, random forests, and make some very important modifications uh, in its loss function and its, uh, uh, its mechanism, like how it, it, it's using the splits, to actually target uh, the average treatment, this conditional average treatment effect. So a very, very, uh, well, quick reminder of what random forests do. So when we don't, we are not after causality, we are just after a prediction, uh, then a regression tree would predict outcomes uh, of an observation using uh, the outcomes of its neighbors on the leaves of a tree. And we achieve this tree by splitting uh, 
the data according to cutoff values of different axes um, as, as, as far as we want. Um, and we stop when we feel that we come up with a good predictor. What is a good predictor? A good predictor is when uh, we use this tree structure for a new sample and we manage to minimize the root mean square prediction error uh, in there. Um, instead of looking at a tree, this kind of partitioned uh, two-dimensional space on the right side of the slide is, is, is perhaps a, a nicer way of thinking about it. So all those, all those dots which are in this partition with the X Will be used to calculate um, the uh, will be used to calculate uh, the prediction of the x in this sample. Um, to improve the performance of regression trees, it has been suggested that well, it's better to do them again and again on random uh, subsamples of the data and build many trees. So this shows this this slide here shows three instances of trees uh, where. Um, the partitions of the data will be a little bit different each time. So this little x will get different, somewhat different neighbors. And uh, we can uh, use a weighting representation uh, to keep track of how often someone's neighbors have been used uh, um, to estimate their own predictions. So uh, this, uh, this weighting representation will be, will be very useful to get us to the conditional average treatment effect. Uh, but before that, we, we need to modify this algorithm a little bit. So instead of uh, splitting trees uh, according to criterion, which maximizes, which minimizes prediction error, uh, the causal forests uh, suggested by, by AT and colleagues would uh, use a splitting criterion, which maximizes the treatment effect heterogeneity. And uh, this is done by building so-called causal trees where instead of doing predictions on the partitions of the data, we do we estimate treatment effects on the partitions of the data. So you remember those, uh, those little uh, residual and residual regressions, which we were hoping to do on some local neighborhoods. This is exactly what we are doing here. So taking a partition of the data and, and estimating this local average treatment effect. And look at uh, potential splits of the tree uh, and stop where we find a version which maximizes the differences between the estimated treatment effects. So we want on the leaves of the tree uh, have observations with similar treatment effects and between the leaves of the tree uh, observations with different treatment effects. And again, according to the random, similar to random forests, we do this many times and we get uh, causal forests. Um, we store the weight, we save the weights, uh, which signifies how often an uh, observation was used to estimate uh, a treatment effect in a given point. And these weights that will be then used in our estimator of the conditional average treatment effect. So uh, this formula is simple, a weighted version of that residual and residual regression, which you have seen before. And uh, well, what uh, the authors state here is that uh, this estimator will have nice properties. Uh, it will be asymptotically normal, and we can have inference for it, which is based on resampling from the forest. So there is something particular about the solution uh, of, of generalized random forests for, uh, for the conditional average treatment effect parameter, which allows us nice inference. So how, how is it done in practice? So this, this was really uh, just showing you a little bit of, hopefully a little bit of intuition of, 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 uh, of how uh, regression forests can get us to conditional average treatment effect. In practice, um, well, we can use, for example, pack, the package uh, which, which ATN colleagues have developed. And the way, uh, the way uh, they recommend to, to, to do this is first, well, deal with the confounding. So estimating those nuisance uh, functionals, the propensity score and the outcome regression, uh, and calculating the residual, residualized variables will hopefully, according to the assumptions, uh, deconfound or estimate. So that's the first step. And the second step is estimating the causal forest when we are doing this splitting to maximize heterogeneity of treatment effects. Um, we can uh, 
we can conduct certain tests which will test whether our conditional average treatment effect is actually a better predictor of our treatment effect than just using the average treatment effect. I will show you this test. And uh, we can obtain estimates of individual level treatment effects. The caveat, of course, it's not completely individual. It is a expect conditional average treatment effect uh, which represents uh, an in, uh, for for the characteristics of an individual with the characteristics from that group. So of course, these treatment effects are not individualized to the extent that they can take anything unobserved into account. So they represent a group which look like them. Uh, and then after this, we can estimate the average treatment effect and subgroup average treatment effect using uh, using all these uh, nuisance functions and the tau x uh, from before. And as a last, like fourth step, we can actually use all these uh, nuisance nuisance components and estimated gates to plug into estimators of optimal policy assignment rules, which I hopefully have time to show you. Well, that's it. So this was really this was really the a kind of a quick uh, taster of of the methods. So, so I'm going to now show you how this can be used in practice and how and what it actually gives us. So the first thing to to point out and not to uh, kind of uh, forget about is the confounding. So we are in a setting of observational data, and we had large imbalances. We had large imbalances according to important socioeconomic coverages such as wealth quintiles, uh, receiving subsidies or not, education, uh, literacy and age. So those with contributory health insurance, uh, as expected, they, they were better off, less vulnerable than those with uninsured. And after propensity score weighting, most of these differences uh, uh, shrank. Uh, below um, standardized mean differences of 10 percent not to zero so we still have to worry a little bit about it but that is why we use the doubly robust approaches and we don't just rely on on uh, on the confounding with the inverse probability weighting uh, for the subsidized subsidized health insurance scheme um, again we found really big uh, really really big um, uh, differences according to pretty much the same the same cover rates, but in the opposite direction now. So those who got the subsidized health insurance, they were poorer, they were more likely to get subsidies, uh, less likely to be uh, literate and less educated than the uninsured. And, but again, uh, most of these differences uh, disappeared uh, after propensity score weighting. So these are the average results. Um, the average results from a non-machine learning, doubly robust estimator, uh, inverse probability, probability weighted regression adjustment, and another one, which is the average treatment effect estimator, which we get out of the causal forest package, which is essentially a, a machine learning based augmented inverse probability weighted estimate. So what do we see? Well, first, the machine learning and non-machine learning methods that they don't vary a lot, so that so that the, the, they actually are quite similar. So for the average, it didn't seem to matter too much whether we use machine learning or not. Um, a more striking thing is that for the contributory health insurance, we, we find a, a difference between the treatment effect for the treated and the treatment effect for the controls and the average treatment effect, which is much closer to the treatment effect for the controls because many more people were uh, un uninsured in this data set than insured. So the question is whether this, um, sorry, I, yeah, this slide got, got rid of the code of forest estimate, but it's the same thing. So uh, the question is, well, could some of this heterogeneity be explained uh, with observed characteristics? Um, it seems that those who were not insured with this contributory scheme, they would have benefited more from it than those who were actually insured. And we do know that those who were not insured, they were the more, uh, the bit, a little bit better off, and those who were, no, worse off, and those who were insured, they were better off. So there is some, uh, some hypothesis there that maybe 
it, it would be more vulnerable subgroups of the population who would have benefited more. So this is something we can look at uh, using our causal forest algorithm. So one output we're getting from the causal forest algorithm is, is variable importance. So what is variable importance for, um, for, for, uh, for example, a, a random forest algorithm? It would tell us how important uh, each variable was in splitting the underlying trees, how often they were used, to split the trees. So in this case, this variable signify the importance of certain variables to explain heterogeneity. So we find that for subsidized health insurance, um, age seemed to have mattered a lot. Um, certain variables which indicated um, socioeconomic disadvantage, such as getting cash transfer, um, and uh, things like whether a household has been through some natural disaster uh, recently. For the contributory health insurance, we find that interestingly, the most important predictor is where a household is located. So East Java seems to seem to be different from everything else. But again, education, wealth, quintiles, rurality come back. And these, these variables, education, rurality, and wealth quintiles were actually pre-specified in our analysis. So the first thing we do is we take our individualized treatment effect estimates and uh, aggregate them back up into average treatment effects and first look at the, the pre-specified subgroups of interest. Oh, no, sorry, there, there's one more thing we do before, before we look at that. We can actually uh, kind of look at the distribution of, uh, of our individual uh, treatment effects uh, from the causal forest. So this is really what we get uh, from from the package, from, from, from running the algorithm for each uh, unit in our sample, we get a predicted treatment effect. And here I am uh, presenting a histogram of the point estimates. So not, uh, not confidence intervals around it, it's available, but it's a bit hard to interpret. So let's just focus on the, on the point estimates. And uh, well, we see that for contributory health insurance, it was mostly zero uh, and uh, there is a heterogeneity test available, which is essentially an omnibus test uh, asking the question, is this Kate better than just, just uh, taking the average for everyone uh, as a treatment effect? And we, we find that uh, there is a significant heterogeneity in this program. On the other hand, for the subsidized health insurance, we, uh, the heterogeneity test does not uh, find significant heterogeneity and the estimated treatment effects are uh, well somewhat closely uh, closely uh, concentrated around zero. So what I promised you is looking at first the pre-specified -pre subgroups uh, from the causal forest. So for contributory health insurance, we, we do find some fairly uh, visible and interpretable um, gradient in terms of socioeconomic status. So those in the lowest wealth quintiles, those with the lowest education levels, those in rural communities seem to benefit more in terms of added probability of uh, accessing health services than those in the better of uh, communities and do, uh, uh, or those who were more educated. So this is this could be a nice message for a policymaker. Well, this is a uh, you know the the more vulnerable benefit more from your from your program. So keep doing your good work. Um, the problem is that when we look at the same thing for subsidized health insurance, then everything looks a bit flat. So it seems that the subsidized health insurance where uh, the job of the policymaker was really to to provide health insurance to those uh, most in need. Um, everyone seemed to have benefited kind of uh, close to zero so no, no uh, statistically significant uh, subgroup uh, specific average impacts but we did so these were the pre-specified subgroups but we did our, our entire causal forest exercise to actually find something new to find some other variables which which might might lead us to a subgroup where uh, there is actually some heterogeneity. Uh, so what we 
what we did is, is we also having a look what's so what's going on with East Java province for the contributor health insurance. Uh, it seems that uh, they benefit uh, much more than than the rest of Indonesia. Um, and for the subsidized health insurance, we find that those expecting the third child or higher order child, they seem to be almost um, well, almost significantly benefiting. Um, I am trying to use the term statistical significance in 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 a, in a very cautious face here, and probably I should not use it at all, because um, we have discovered these subgroups using a statistical algorithm. Then doing inference for these discovered subgroups has introduces all sorts of uh, you know pretest biases, which without another layer of cross-fitting or cross-validation would definitely not give us correct inference. So this is, if you want to uh, interpret these estimates, uh, then it's one on my to-do list to try another layer of cross-fitting. Um, with a larger data set, I would not hesitate. With the, with the data set we have and um, the way, the fact that our outcome variable is um, is like 80 percent so it's the opposite of a rare, rare outcome it makes me it makes me a little bit worried about the the success of, of another layer of cross-validation here um i forgot to say that uh cross-validation has been uh employed while estimating the nuisance components so the propensity scores and the regression functions and also then estimating the conditional average treatment effects the 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 random forest actually provide a very nice way of being able to use cross validation without losing the data because we can always just estimate uh, or nuisance parameters from one part of the data which happen to be in the in the first row and then and then estimate uh, the rest on the rest of the data but because we do this many many times is eventually everyone will be used so but but here i think one more round of cross validation would be useful um Okay, so so we so what did we learn so far? We learned that there was a lot significant heterogeneity in com contributory health insurance. We, we we saw that those more vulnerable they uh, they uh, they benefited more, and we saw that well in, for the subsidized health insurance we couldn't really we couldn't really find any 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 interesting heterogeneity even after digging a bit deeper. But there is one more interesting thing, thing which we could do which is uh, try to focus on this, this different target of estimation, this optimal policy estimate. So um, try to see whether we could say something about how uh, the Indonesian policymaker should have uh, targeted these health policies to people instead of how they did it in, in practice. So more formally, what you want to do is to learn a policy pie which maps a woman's characteristics, in this case, woman's characteristics, uh, into a binary decision, treat or not treat, or give health insurance, health insurance or not, within a policy class, a large pie. And uh, in this sort of literature, the aim is to minimize the regret, which is uh, defined as the difference between the expected utility uh, and the learned policy uh, in the best, uh, which is the best in the policy class. Yeah, I think there's a typo in this, in this slide. Uh, so the proposed solution to, 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 to learn policies and minimize regret, uh, again, by, uh, by Ethi and Wager, this 2021 econometrica paper, is to, is to maximize uh, this formula, which takes um, the, the, that red gamma, is essentially the W of a score. So I'm going to show you what that exactly is. But it is a uh, this, this two pi x is is just essentially a reward function, which would uh, which would reward uh, uh, those uh, who are treated uh, with some with some value of the policy, and would penalize those who are not treated with kind of the loss of not getting the policy. Uh, and they show that. Um, there are some nice uh, theoretical properties of of this way of of estimating the optimal policy uh, they characterize the regret bounds uh, the, the regret converges 
uh, according to sample size and according to the complexity of the of the policy class. So what is this score? Um, the score? The score we're using is this augmented uh, inverse probability weighted W robust score for the average treatment effect parameter. And so those who have done some W robust estimation, they have probably seen this thing before. Uh, it's a lot of things going on, but the good news is that we have everything already. So we, we need the estimated Kate, uh, which we have, and we need this residualized uh, um, uh, treatment and outcome variables, which we also have. So that's excellent. We have either estimated everything using machine learning or using the causal forests. So we are ready to go to plug this in, into this value function and do some optimization to select the best, uh, the best policy. Uh, well, that's where the kind of uh, the details and the practicality start kicking in. So what kind of policy uh, class, how, how large policy classes we should be looking at, how much uh, you know, computational burden we want to, we want to undergo. Um, in, this, uh, in this package, which comes with a paper, uh, AC and colleagues suggest to use uh, depth K trees. So look at a policy, a policy class, which is essential decision trees. I'm going to show you how they look like in a sec and do an exhaustive tree search. So look at every single uh, way we can split people, uh, evaluate uh, their value function and, uh, and, and choose a kind of simple looking decision tree, uh, which maximizes the payoff. So what I did here uh, in my data, I, I uh, wanted to kind of do some very uh, preliminary exploratory analysis. So I tried depth one, two, and three trees. And I did something which I hope makes sense. And I have seen others doing it before, which is I excluded a bunch of covariates from the tree search. So um, Algorithmic fairness and uh, kind of a worry that algorithms use variables which they shouldn't be using. That's a kind of a very hot topic in, uh, in, in, in machine learning. And we can, uh, we can, we can link that issue here. Um, I did not have uh, very sensitive information of this women, which maybe a policymaker wouldn't want to use. Um, that could be, for example, ethnicity or, uh, or, 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 uh, you know, um, any, any sort of protected characteristics, but I did have some variables which are really quite irrelevant. So for example, which year the child was born or what's the sex of the child or even what the province, I thought that for a policy uh, making a, a kind of a real policy question, uh, we, we, would, we would want to base rules on these variables. So I really just kept, um, a shorter list, like around the half of the variables, socioeconomic variables, education, and so on, to, to potentially go into the policy. And I also attempted to introduce costs of the policy. So, of course, you have seen that um, for the subsidized health insurance, we actually had some negative values. But otherwise, you one might ask, why not just treat everyone, right? So this is not this is not a drug which has some side effects where I really have to think about uh, whether they, people should take it or not. This is a good thing. Uh, it's, it's providing people health insurance, so why not treat everyone? And of course, the answer is that that would be nice, but uh, there might be important constraints. We may not be able to, to, to provide uh, subsidized health insurance to everyone to start with. So we need to impose some sort of uh, capacity constraints. And a very simple way, which has been suggested to to do this is to subtract the estimated average treatment effect from the reward. So that would uh, that would immediately make the reward for everyone much smaller, and and that would uh, that would make uh, make it non-trivial whom to treat because suddenly people will have a non uh, non uh, positive payoff from getting the policy. For for the for the case I'm using subsidized health insurance, this can be conceptualized as the price of providing the health insurance, the, the actual premium which is paid. But I, I'm not doing that. I'm I'm subtracting the average treatment effect for um, for for reasons of simplicity. Okay, so what happens if I 
if I tell the software uh, I, I only want policies within a class of depth one trees, then one it will choose one variable, which is whether someone had a poor uh, this kind of poverty uh, card, and it's a little bit a uh, little bit uh, counterintuitive that if someone doesn't have if someone has a someone doesn't have a poor card then the person should not be insured but you know this is just this is so far just very illustrative um maybe what we we can have a look though is the number who would be uh, predicted to be insured and uninsured under this policy so we have now uh, close to 9000 people who this who the algorithm wants to insure as opposed to remember uh, there were only around a thousand people with insurance, so it's a much much bigger number, uh, which is which is suggestive, which which, which, which um, gives us some indication that the observed insurance allocation was probably very very far from from optimal. So what happens if we go into depth of two trees? Uh, we still have around 700 seven, seven to eight uh, thousand people insured and now it's bringing in new variables such as age uh, whether a household uh, um, has experienced natural disaster uh, or whether there is a village midwife um, located in the village and if i allow uh, a class uh, of depth of three trees then uh, it's bringing in kind of further uh, socioeconomic variables, which is whether someone got uh, uh, cash transfer, uh, uh, is eligible for cash transfer, uh, and again, uh, education and, and order of birth uh, does uh, play a role. I am not, so I'm not aiming to interpret this by the letter because I, we will see there is a bunch of challenges here. So I would certainly not want to give this to the Indo Indonesian Minister of Health now that forget about what you've been doing so far, use my output from, from the software. But, but hopefully it, it's interesting to, 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 to make us think a little. So what happens if I also impose costs? So now suddenly I have only 3000. Uh, which the algorithm uh, wants me to ensure. Uh, but even this, even this 3,000 people is, of course, more than how, how many people were uh, insured before. So the, the green numbers here are those who, uh, who were insured, but the policy also wants, uh, wants them to insure and who were uninsured, and the policy also wants them to, uh, to not insure. Uh, we have uh, 2,700 people who were previously uninsured, but according to policy, it would be better to insure them. So it shows that even if we account for costs, the this tool uh, can can tell us something about uh, about the benefits of of insuring those who had uh, who had a benefit from this health insurance. Okay. Um, so what are the so what are kind of the discussion points? So what what makes me not want to go all the way to interpret this very simple policy? Uh, well, of course, it would be nice, uh, and that's something I, I will do very soon, to compare the utility of the estimated policies versus the current allocation. Again, we need some cross-validation for this, so that's why that hasn't happened yet. But that way, we could actually rank whether a depth 3, tip 3 policy is better than a depth 2, 3 policy in terms of expected payoffs. And of course, we could go very complex. So um, other authors have proposed uh, completely non-parametric policies, which is essentially a black box algorithm. You include the X variables, and there comes out a prediction for whether someone should be treated or not. And uh, well, it's in, in most studies which I have seen, kind of simulation studies, it seems that those policies are in fact the ones with the highest payoff because they are allow, allow uh, a very high level of flexibility the question is is there a trade-off between interpretation and, and, and complexity would i be better off going to the indonesian uh, minister of health with uh, with an ipad with uh, like a fun kind of r shiny app where we can include someone's characteristics and then it outputs whether they should be insured or not or should i go with uh, be to adapt to decision tree and and suggest to use that um, 
as uh, as some sort of supporting information for their new uh, new eligibility criteria for subsidized health insurance. Of course, another uh, difficulty is that we observe insurance status, um, but can only uh, assign eligibility to the policy. So, so, so what I have been estimating so far is the utility of forcing someone to take health insurance. But what I could, what I could actually, uh, what I could really implement uh, in in a health policy setting, that would be eligibility. So I don't know how to how to uh, account for the discrepancies between there, between that. Uh, and of course, uh, putting back my health economist hat back on, of course, healthcare utilization here is a very partial uh, outcome. Sometimes we call it a surrogate outcome. And we don't necessarily care about whether someone will uh, utilize healthcare or not. We, what we is eventually care about is actually health. So uh, it would be nice if we could get if we could take surrogacy relationships into account in this in these reward functions, potentially beyond the data at hand. In my data set, I do have infant mortality, but it's such a rare outcome that I did not. I did not uh, attempt to do this uh, somewhat data hungry analysis on, on, on that outcome. And of course, uh, it would be nice to be able to take costs and budget constraints uh, into account. And it would be very nice if we could also uh, account for the distribution of health, not just the expectation of health. And there's some work on this, but I, I am very lucky to have a research grant by the UK Medical Research Council where I will be able to look at this in more detail. And I think, yeah, I think I think this is it. I'm done. I, I I'm hope that I I convince you a little bit that causal machine learning can be somewhat helpful about learning about treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, we can uh, we can speculate about why um, the subsidized health insurance have uh, have. Uh, not resulted in the expected outcomes in terms of uh, improving uh, healthcare access. There are some, there are some hypotheses that it's actually the, the quality of care which is so bad that people don't even bother. This data is quite old, so hopefully by looking at new data we can see how how this is currently. The very important limitation is around no unobserved confounding. So. Uh, that that is something which we, we kind of need to return to in this study, but more general, thinking about how these methods can actually account for that, the fact that people do self-select into insurance based on variables which may not be available for the researchers. Instrumental variables and panel data approaches are uh, promising, but we don't we don't have these tools readily available, available to use. So there is some methods research needed there. So that could be something for you guys to do as well. Thank you very much. That's that's it from me. And I'm sorry that I a little bit uh, ran out of time. Um, yeah, no more, no more talking from my side.